Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, or let it prove to be acceptable in your sight. For, Lord, you are my strength, and, Lord, you are indeed my redeemer. And this we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Uh, let us all say together, amen. Amen, amen. Okay, man, this, uh, we winding down uh, March, and this is actually our, um, you know, coming up to our Resurrection Sunday, which is going to be on this Sunday. Uh, the theme for this entire month for revival was, is what's on the inside that counts. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks where? He looks at the heart. Amen? Amen? The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That's the way it works with God, isn't it right? Uh, I want to talk about today, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I'm really talking from the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, the book of Ecclesiastes is a very interesting book. Um, and the word ecclesia, ecclesia, the Ecclesiastes, ecclesia, uh, is the English word for ecclesia. It's really the church. Uh, the Greek word for ecclesia means to be called out. It means to be called out. And this is why, you know, this is the book. It's called Ecclesiastes because God is actually, part, I mean, Solomon is actually writing here. And he's writing here from another perspective of his life. And we know that when Solomon, we know about the story of Solomon. And when God asked him what he wanted, and he says, just give me an understanding heart so I know how to judge your people. And because he put the purpose of God ahead of his own personal agenda, you know, we ask somebody, just, just, somebody, just tell me what you want, and I can give you anything you want. But he wanted what God wanted. And God said, because you didn't ask for riches, and because you didn't ask to kill your enemies, and because you didn't ask for something selfishly, God says, I'm going to give you riches and honor and stuff. Physical blessing. Believe me, we call a lot of things blessing. Blessing means what makes me happy. That's all it means, okay? But actually, the blessings that God wants to give you is spiritual. Ephesians 1 3, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And where are they? They are in what? Heavenly places. And how do you get them? You get them in Christ. So, physical blessings. Blessings are not blessings, they are additives. They are things God adds to you, you know, as a result of the spiritual blessings he put in your life. That's a different perspective of the believer. The enemy wants you to think that real blessings are physical. And that's why a lot of uh, uh, false prophets will get up and they'll preach the physical. They'll preach the physical, amen? Remember, Satan offered Jesus the physical. He took him up and said, all this I give to you, all the kingdoms of the world, I'm going to give all this to you. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. Amen? But no, God wants himself to be displayed in the world. So we're looking for spiritual blessings that will help us to be more like Christ because that is the purpose that God saved us for. To be conformed unto the image of his son. We want to be more like him. We want people to look at us and see a visible representation of him. That's the focus of the believer. And then the Bible said, and I add these things unto you. <laughs> and you ain't got to worry about it because guess what? I know how to bless you exceedingly. I know how to bless you abundantly. And I know how to bless you above all you can never ask for or ever think of. The only time I ask God for a physical blessing, I ask God for a physical blessing because I want to be a blessing. Because the Bible says what? Don't look on your own things, but look on the things of others. Mind not your own things, but condescend to those of low estate. There's nothing wrong asking for physical blessings when you're trying to be a blessing. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? I mean, you? That's why, what did James say? Your prayers are not asking because you ask amiss. You miss it. 
you miss what you should be asking for. You miss it. So Ecclesiastes is a powerful book because what it does is it answers the questions about man's search for satisfaction. It answers that question. What most people are searching for, the book of Ecclesiastes answers it. Because they haven't learned one thing in this world that you cannot, cannot be happy without God. You cannot find fulfillment in your life without God. And Solomon found that out. He found it. So he wrote this book to the heart of the Holy Spirit to give us some insight because think about it. Think about it. Everything that people think they got to have in order to be happy, Solomon had it and he still wasn't happy. I, 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 I was doing um, some research because the Bible never tells us how rich Solomon really was. And I mean, in numerical dollars, you got to have it. Uh, and they, the guy, he broke this thing down about Solomon, man. Probably was a his estimated worth was probably between 100 to $200 trillion in the day's money. Nobody could touch that kind of wealth. Solomon was so wealthy that the knobs on the stables where he kept his horses was a million dollars in the day's money. So you got to look at this tremendous wealth this man had, you know, and how many people he fed every day. And his staff. It's just, it just mind-boggling the way God can, can add stuff to your life, man. Amen. But in all of that, he says, that ain't it. That ain't it. Now, man is a trichotomy. Just like in the spirit world, you have a father, son, and the Holy Spirit. And as human beings, we're made in the image of God. So we, there's a trichotomy in us, too. Look at First Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved complete. So man is what? He's three things. He's a spirit, he's a soul, and he's a body. It's a trichotomy of who we are. Now, let's kind of break that down a little bit more. To know how each one relates to one another is the key to happiness. It's the key to happiness. God made man a spirit so he can be God conscious. <laughs> How do we know that we are in the presence of God? He does it through our spirit. It's called our attitude. And Romans 8, 16 talks about that. He said, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, will bear witness with our spirit that we are a child of God. Our spirit is our attitude. So you become God conscious. One thing you know about a person that's really saved and focused on God, God gives them a different attitude. And you know you're in the consciousness of God. In the consciousness of God. I told you before, before I became saved, I used to be a drinker because I was a nightclub performer. Because I worked in a club. How many folk you know go to club don't drink? Okay. So you go <laughs> That's what you do when you go to the club. <laughs> you go to the club, you drink, I entertain, did all the stuff. God delivered me from that. Not because I went through a 12-step program or anything of that nature. God delivered me to that because when I got saved and put my focus on him, his spirit changed my spirit. So I don't drink anymore. Why? Because I have a different attitude about drinking. Look at the changes in your life today. How did those changes came? God gave you a different attitude about it. That's the way it works, people. So your attitude will let you know the consciousness of God. It push you into the consciousness of God, the awareness of God. He does it through your attitude. Okay? Let's kind of look at that in, uh, in the Bible. Job 32 and 8. He said, it is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. God puts a spirit in us, and through our attitudes, he gives us understanding. You know, the Bible says, God's looking for worshipers. What kind of worshipers is he looking for? Those who are in, who are in focus with him, and they're going to worship him, what? In spirit and in what? Truth. Their attitude is different. Their attitude is different. Amen? Now, what is worship in this context? Worship is whenever your focus is on God. 
If your focus is on pleasing God, that's an act of worship. Worship is not singing and praising and jumping and hollering. Those are expressions of worship. But those are not worship. Worship is a focus. Because we got some devils know how to sing and jump and holler and shout. You know, and that most of what they do, they just entertain people. But worship is, my focus is on God. Amen. And the Bible says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Who are you singing to? You ain't singing to the audience. You're singing to God. Your song, your song is a prayer. So you're singing to the Lord a new song. That's worship, people. That is worship. That is worship. And so your worship said, you got to, you're married, and you, you, you go to God and say, God, what do I need to do to please my wife? What do I need to do to minister to my wife? Then whatever you give her is an act of worship. It can't be based on how good the wife is. Those people, people's goodness is a motivation, but never a motive. You can motivate me to be good, but you're not my motive. Because when you take the motivation away, <laughs> I still got to be good. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that's it. Go to Psalm 1828. Psalm 1828. He said, you light my lamp, the Lord my God. You are the one who illumines not my darkness. And what is, that, what is, the, what is darkness? What is darkness? Darkness is your ignorance. So God, you're the one keeps me from being ignorant of your ways. Or ignorant of what you want me to do. Does this make any sense? So the spirit makes me what? It makes me God conscious. The soul makes me self-conscious. The spirit that lives in me makes me God conscious. The soul in me makes me self-conscious. Now what is the soul? I hope I'm not boring you today. The soul is three things. It is your mind, your emotions, and your will. Those encompasses your soul. How do I keep my soul right? By controlling my mind, controlling what I'm thinking. Be renewed in your mind. Be exchanged in your thinking. Because that is going to control your feeling. And when you can control your feelings, then that will control your choices. Why? Because most of us make our choices based on how we feel. It's the most human thing to do, right? <laughs> how many of you ever said, but I know it's the right thing to do, I just don't feel like it right now. <laughs> I mean, I know I shouldn't, uh, you cuss me, I know I shouldn't say nothing back, but I just don't feel like it right now. And see, we have to make those kind of things in our mind because here's the thing about most of us, I told you before, we have something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons simply means that when people approach you, you mirror those things back to them. So if you curse me, then the, I have mirror neuron, then that's what I do is curse you back. You know, I give back to you whatever you give to me. So you got to be careful. You got to keep God on your mind. So if God stays on my mind, he controls my emotion. He controls my emotion. He controls my choices. That's the way it works, people. That's the way it works. Amen. And so let's go to Psalm 13 and 2. He said, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart all day. In other words, I'm responsible for my own feelings. Nobody else is responsible for that. You are. And you have to control your feelings by controlling your thoughts. <laughs> People always say, you get on my nerve. No, I don't get on your nerve. You give me permission to be on your nerve. Nobody gets on your nerve unless you give them permission. <laughs> and you got to determine I'm not giving nobody that kind of power over my life, no matter power over me. So I, I got to think different about them. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking this way about them. I think different about them. It's like turning the channel on a television station. If you don't like what you're looking at, why are you sitting there crying and being all upset? All you got to do is just 
turn the channel. I wish I had somebody. Amen. You turn your eye. You know, I told you about the, the, the turn your head ministry. If you don't like what you're looking at, just turn your head. Just look at something else. You know what I'm saying? The one thing you don't do, let me tell you something. You don't try to get rid of a spirit by focusing on it. If you focus on it, you can continue to do it. You're going to continue to power. It still got your attention. But what you got to do is refocus on it. I, I can't look at ribs. I know everybody's eating those ribs, and I'm looking at the ribs, and I'm trying to convince myself I should not be looking at those ribs. As long as I keep looking at it, I'm still focused on it. It still has my attention. Whoever got your attention has your life. Amen? So what I need to do is to, what, is to start looking at the chicken. And when I look at the chicken, then I get a different attitude about the ribs. That's the way it was in that. So we got a spirit that makes us God conscious. We got a soul that makes us self conscious. Amen. We got a body that makes us world conscious. That means we are conscious in our body of everything that's around us that's not godly. That's what the consciousness of the body has to do. The key to happiness is not salvation alone. Because the Bible says you got to work it out. So don't think you're going to pray a prayer or whatever and everything's going to be hunky-dory from now on. It's not going to work that way. It is a continuing process of life. Amen? That's what Philippians 2.12 says. One of my favorite scriptures. It says, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. You need to work out your salvation. And you need to work it with fear and trembling. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? What fear mean? When God says to fear him, it's two-dimensional. <laughs> it's two-dimensional. There is, there is a semblance of being afraid of God. You say, you should not be afraid of God. Oh, yes, you should. <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, I want my children to fear me. Yeah, but I raised them up to be afraid of me, too. And I would tell them quick, two things in the world you don't mess with is me and government mailboxes. You tamper with either one of them, it's going to get you in a whole lot of trouble. Just think about it. If there was no fear of getting fired on your job, how would you act on it? So don't walk right to me. I ain't scared of nothing. You better be. You better be. Amen. You better be. So there ought to be a, a sense of being afraid, of being actually afraid of disappointing God. There ought to be a sense of that. There ought to be a sense of that. And so is God going to punish you for being disobedient to him? No, he's not. God does not punish believers. Their punishment has already been meted out in Christ. Christ took our punishment. I know that's scary to some people. God just lets you deal with the consequence of disobedience. That's all. The blessings are in the obedience. It's already built in. So stop asking God, I need you to give me some more blessings. No, you don't. You need to ask God to help you obey because the blessings are already in the obedience. <laughs> Can you go back to Ephesians 1 3? This is Bible study, right? Okay. Let me prove my point here. Let me prove my point here. Let me prove it. Let's go back here. Can you dig that up for me? Uh, Ed, Ed is the smartest man I know. <laughs> It said, blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every. And yeah, all is in the King James. But it's the same thing. If he's already given us every blessing, there is no more. Oh, my God. Amen. I mean, I mean come on, people. Amen. If, if, if I say... I got all your money. Now, how much money you got left? 
So God has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Think about it. Think about it. When you are born naturally, all of us were born naturally. Okay. When you are born as a baby, everything you need on your body came with birth. I mean, you don't, you don't, five years later, you get another eye, or, you know, six years later, you know, you only had three fingers, and then two fingers came up after six years. It don't work that way. Everything in your body is given to you complete. At birth, it can only mature. It can only get bigger. It can only develop, but it's there. Amen? You're born with two breasts, you, you, you may get bigger breasts, you know what I'm saying, but you only get two. Does that make sense? So it makes sense if you're born spiritually, why would God birth you spiritually deficient? The Bible said we are complete in him. There's no deficiency in Christ. He is our sufficiency. The only thing has to do, it has to be developed. It has to be mature. And that's something you have to do. You're born here with everything you've got. But you've got to eat right. You've got to do the right things in order to fear. That's exactly what God is saying to us spiritually. So, you know, don't ask God. Give me more blessings. Ask God, show me how to be more obedient so you can release what's built into the blessing. Amen. God does not allow your sin to punish you. He does allow your sin to chastise you, to chastise you, to bring you to correction. If God punished you, you would die. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Why do you think Jesus died? He died because he took on sin. That was punishment. I wish I had some time. God ain't going to spank you. He's going to kill you. And that's the way it works, people. That's the way it works. So what I'm doing, I'm working out my salvation. And what is a, what, 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 what do you call working out your salvation? What is it? In fear. Let me go back to that. It worked fear. There's an art of being afraid. Because I know the consequence of doing things without God. <laughs> the most miserable person in the world. It's not a sinner. The most miserable person in the world. Is a saint who's out of fellowship. Because when he loses his fellowship, he loses his joy. He loses his peace. Hmm. Right, that's, that's what it is. Amen. So it's called sanctification. Working out your sanctification. Working out what sets you apart from yourself naturally. What sets you apart from that. It's called sanctification. Now, there is a sanctification scripture. I quote it all the time. Many of you don't focus on it enough. But if you want to live a sanctified life, it's not in the New Testament. It's actually in the Old Testament. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That's why it's quoted so much. Because hmm. when I rely on God, trust, in, trust, trust means to rely on God. Do you realize that God is the only person who can command trust? You and I can't command nobody to trust us. We have to earn it. <laughs> and the reason why we got to earn trust because trust is the component of love. I trust you because I'm secure about the way you're loving me. If I'm not secure about the way you're loving me, I don't trust you. And because we're secure in his love, he can command us to trust him. Because I'm the Lord, I don't change. Amen? I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And guess what? Before my word will fail, heaven and earth will pass away. Why? 
because they were built on my word. They became whatever I said. God did not physically put anything together. He spoke it. He spoke it and became in existence. That's why God cannot lie. He cannot lie because whatever he speaks will become whatever he says. <laughs> if God looks at Miss Boone right now and says, you are a white woman, immediately she will turn white. Why? Because he said it. Oh, my God. Amen. That's the kind of God he is, people. And he said, hey, hey, I spoke it, and if I lie, it brings everything down. Just like in a relationship. I don't care how good someone treats you, if they lie to you, it will bring the whole relationship down. One lie destroys everything. One grain of dirt and five gallons of water and the whole water dirty. It, it don't take as much. So God said, I want you to trust me. I want you to rely on me, what? With all your heart. Trust is only evident when things go wrong. <laughs> and you really don't know what's in your heart until things go wrong. <laughs> Anybody can have a good heart when everything's around you good. Anybody can say, oh, man, I, I ain't got no problem doing good, man, when everybody around you good. Anybody can love people when you're around people who love you. If they're lovable, you can do that. Anybody. You don't have to be saved to do that. But I'm going to tell you what. When God wants you to see how much of his love he has in you, he sends you somebody unlovable. Somebody that's the total opposite of you. Somebody who will irritate you. Somebody who aggravates you. And they will pull whatever relationship with God you got in you. Because that's how you learn how to be like him. Matter why does he do that? Because look, he deal with you every day. He deals with me every day. And we irritate him. And we are aggravation. And we, we are hard-headed. And we are stubborn. And we won't always do what he tells us. One whooping after another whooping. I don't know how many people ever go to the altar and say, God, I just did this the first time. We normally go to the altar with repeat sins. <laughs> Didn't I whoop your behind about that last week? <laughs> because here's what the devil does the devil will always give you a reason to do it he does he does my doctor told me don't eat pork next thing I know somebody told me you can eat it just put some vinegar on it it'll be alright <laughs> my blood pressure was skyrocketing he said I don't want you to eat it they pork to be able to do it. He said, listen, stay away from a whole bunch of fried food. You can eat Maryland chicken every now and then. Maybe a fried every now and then. Don't eat that stuff every day. Every day. Then you said, maybe if I pull the skin off. <laughs> maybe the problem is just the skin. Oh, my God. Sanctification is to what? When you align your spirit man with your soul man. When you align your spirit man with your soul man, that controls your body. That controls your body. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. Don't trust you. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's another word for fear. To acknowledge him. It's called respect. Respect means to acknowledge. How does a woman respect her husband? She acknowledges her husband. That's all God is telling you to do. So in all your ways, what you do, you respect God enough that you acknowledge him. Why? Because he owns you. And he built you for his pleasure. So you got to acknowledge God to see, will this please you if I do this? Then the Bible said, if you got that kind of attitude, he said, then I will give you directions that will keep you straight. Oh, somebody ought to clap right there, man. God bless you. I'll give you directions, man. 
I give you direction. This is the way God works. So he lines your spirit man with your soul man, and this is how he controls your bodies. And the result of that is happiness. Psalm 144, 15. How blessed are the people who are so situated. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. I like that scripture. Psalm 127. This is, you know, says, except the Lord build the house. They that what? Labor in vain, they build it. The problem with that is we read Psalm 127, but how does God do it? You need to read Psalm 128, because 128 backs up 127. Listen to what he said. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Now, ah, go back to that, go back to who fears the Lord, who fears the Lord and not to walk in his ways. The Holy Ghost says, remind me of something. I didn't tell you what trembling was. Um, trembling means godly sorrow. When you mess up, then you come before God with sorrow that you disappoint. And the Bible said, only godly sorrow will make you change your mind. Because when you're looking at God, you can ask God, you can just say forgiveness without any thought in your mind to change your attitude toward what you do. So what do you mean by godly sorrow? Godly sorrow is saying, I need your spirit to change my thoughts about this. That's God himself. Yeah. Because his spirit has to bear witness with my spirit. So what I need you to do, Lord, if I don't want to smoke anymore, I'm going to go to you and say, Father, I know this is not something you want me to do. I need you to change my thoughts about this. And the Bible says that kind of sorrow Work if repentance. First Corinthians 10, 13. It'll work. <laughs> because if you just ask forgiveness and without godly sorrow, you don't have the power to change your thoughts or the power to change your attitude. Only the Holy Spirit does that. That's why you come to church. You come to church, you want to get to know what God wants you to do. Why? So that he can change your attitude about whatever you're doing. Okay, I don't mean to bore y'all. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. Now this is for everyone. But go to verse number two. He gets specific. When you shall eat the fruit of your hands, you will be happy and it will be well with you. You see, he's still talking to everyone. Just go to verse three. Your wife. Evidently, he's not talking to everyone. He's talking to the man. The everyone he's talking about, he's talking really to the man. He said, look, you need to walk with the Lord and you need to walk in his ways. Why? Because everybody in your house needs to be following you. Because you're the one got to train them. So what's the train? Deacon Cody explained that to me, and I want to explain that a little bit better than I did before. The train is not just the engine. The train is the cars that's connected to the engine, and that makes up the train. Is that right, Deacon Cody? Okay, that's, I got that right now. That makes a lot of more sense. So the husband is the engine, right? But there ain't no train if he ain't got nobody hooked up with it. So everybody's looking at the husband, so the husband... The cause behind the husband is the wife and the children. And so training them means they're going to go wherever you're going because they're hooking up to you. Oh, my God. He said, if you got this kind of attitude, you're going to see a difference in your wife. He said, your wife will become a fruitful vine. Only when you fear the Lord and when you're walking in his ways, if this is your wife, I'm going to tell you something, she'll be a fruitful vine. And what is a fruitful vine? The word fruitful in the Bible means a blessing. 
blessing because fruit is given for the benefit of someone else. You know, the, the, the apple trees don't eat apples. <laughs> I've never seen a pear tree eat a pear. They bear that fruit for the benefit of someone else. So when God says you are fruitful, he means I'm going to bless you so you could be a benefit to somebody else. He said your wife would be a benefit. Now what is a fruitful vine? Vine is where you get the nourishment for the fruit because the fruit comes from the vine. She will be a fruitful vine. Jesus says what? He's the vine. So that woman who hooks her to the vine is going to produce fruit because the vine is what produces the fruit. The vine is the tree. The fruit what comes from the branches. No fruit is named after a branch. The fruit is named after the tree. Come on, y'all help me with that now. Amen? Amen? So whatever fruit that you are producing shouldn't be named after you. It should be named after the tree that produced it. That's why the Bible meant to say give glory to him. The glory to him. You ain't the tree. Why are you trying to get credit for it? Why are you trying to name the fruit after you? The fruit ain't after you, baby. The fruit is after the tree. The tree is the one who produced the fruit. That's why the Bible says you can only know a tree by the fruit that it bears. You can't call it a tree till you see the fruit. You can't go around telling everybody that Jesus is my tree and we don't see no fruit. We got to see the fruit to know what tree it's coming from. Ain't nobody trying to judge whether you saved or not. We're not judges, we're fruit inspectors. That's what we are. Life is a fruitful vine, man. She's a fruitful vine. That's why Proverbs says, everybody rises up, her husband calls her a blessing. That's what every woman works for if you're married. That's what makes you godly. You got to be godly in your house. Anything outside of your house is a performance. Anything outside of your house is hypocritical. If you're not, if you're not a tree at the house, you ain't a tree at the church. I don't know what that had been. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because Satan is not a creator, but he is a good imitator. He knows how to imitate stuff, amen. He knows how to make wrong look right. Satan never meant to tell Eve to do anything wrong. He ain't gonna come to you tell you to do nothing wrong. Not if you say. He gonna tell you to try to do something right the wrong way. He tried to show Eve that she can do something right, but she could do it the wrong way. <laughs> he tried to convince the Adam. That you could be the man of your house, but be the man the wrong way. That's it. And the Bible said, here's the results of all that. Your children will be like olive plants. Your children would be beneficial in the world. And olive, man, was so beneficial. It gave out light. You know, they, they could cook with it. It was good for their health. There was a medicinal. I mean, olive plants do so much things. And they'll be sitting around your table. The blessing that will change this world will be sitting around your table. That's why God don't believe in birth control. Birth control is spiritual genocide. It's because you have bought the lie of Satan. He don't care nothing about your finances. He can prevent some future preacher, some future teacher from coming through your womb. Believe it or not, when you go to heaven, you're going to have to give an account of what God gave to you. You might have had two children, but God said, I put ten in there. <laughs> you chemically killed eight. When you think about how serious that is, it's very serious. It's very serious. I look at Kita Alawale and I see a powerful woman of God, but what if a mother would have had birth control and you never came? Look what the world would have missed. 
Look what Emmanuel would have missed. All because somebody made that decision. Do you think God thinks that way? Anyway, hey, seven. Remember when Cain killed Abel? Y'all remember? What did God say about that murder? He said the blood of Abel is crying from the ground. What did he mean by that? What do you mean by that? He simply mean this. That when you kill somebody, you not just kill them. You kill everything that should have came through their womb. Everything should have came through their conception. He killed not only Abel, not only you killed that man, you killed his future kids, his grandkids, his great-grandkids, his great-great-grandkids. Generations never would have had a chance to be here because you decide to cut it off. So here's the What does Solomon learn through all of this? So the first thing that Solomon did, the first thing that he went wrong, Satan knows how to get you. He always go back to creation. He goes back to creation. He go for everything he does. He goes back to creation. He don't need to come up with nothing. He already got it. He just simply could continue to repeat it. He knows the family is the foundation of our faith because God made family before he made church, before he even made government. So he's more concerned about the foundation. So what he did, he basically destroyed the family. He went immediately. Notice he did not mess with Adam until Adam got a wife. Because he had to mess up Adam before Adam have a baby. Because an eternal man put a seed in an eternal woman. They can only have eternal kids. So Satan got in a hurry. Let me mess him up before he had a baby. When I mess up, I mess up the relationship. Mess up the relationship. See, the sin of a woman, women don't, don't like it when I teach this, but the sin of a woman was that, that not that the devil, see, we think it's about equality. Women want equality. They want to be equal with a man. That is not Satan's strategy. He already knew she was equal to him. He had no issues with that. What Satan convinced the woman in the garden that she can be above him. Her temptation was, what did he tell her? You can be as wise as God. She didn't say you could be as smart as Adam. She said, no, I don't want to be like him. I want to be over him. <laughs> oh, my God. So that was the first thing that Henry did in the garden. The second thing Henry did in the garden is that Eve messed up the divine assignment of roles. That he created them at different time to establish roles. He didn't create them at the same time. He created them at different time to establish roles. And so what happened is God had already set a system for how he was going to communicate with the family. He did it in Genesis. He taught Adam. Then Adam taught Eve. Because when God gave the instructions to Adam, the first instruction that came from God to man, Eve wasn't even there yet. He told Adam of every tree in the garden and every tree in the eat, and the tree that's in the midst of the garden, the day you eat it, you're going to die. You see, Satan did not invent death. God did. But death was powerless. Because death would not have occurred unless they did something to make it happen. That's why the Bible says, 
the power of death is sin. God created death, but death had no power. So how did Eve know what God said when she was communicating with the devil? She got it from Adam. God established that order with the man that he didn't even name the woman. Adam named her. Just like my beautiful sister didn't name herself Adawale. Emmanuel did. Hmm. I don't know why we don't think it works with God, see. And so now the enemy comes in. He only makes an issue with submission in the home. He never makes an issue of submission outside of it. People don't have problem with submission outside the home. They only have problem with submission in it. People go to work every day understanding submission. Don't you? What's the first thing they, they do on your job? They introduce who you're going to be submitting to. This is your supervisor. This is your this. Amen? Y'all don't say nothing. It is a universal principle of life. We struggle with it at home because unless you're spiritually, you're not going to accept it. That's why God don't give instructions to uh, Paul doesn't give instructions to men and women in marriage until you, you can't pick it up on 522 Ephesians. You got to pick it up at 518 because uh, you're not controlled by the Holy Spirit. You would not do this. It would be hard for you to do because Satan ain't going to let you do it. That's why you fight. And I hear women all the time, but what if you ain't got a good husband? You're chosen. <laughs> I mean, God didn't make that choice. You made that choice. Come on now. You sent out an invitation and told everybody, come see the choice I made. Come see the choice I made. Come see who I'm putting over me. You did that. But if God even tells a woman to submit to your husband, if he's, even if he's an unbeliever, if he's an unbeliever, the Bible says you still got to submit to him. Because one thing I've learned about being a, a, a believer is that, and I'm trying to get a many of our church people to understand this. We do not obey God based on personality. Personalities are not formed by you. Are not, you're not the cause of nobody else's personality. You, are, you inherit their personality. If you act crazy in church, it had nothing to do with me. You brought crazy from that house. And so therefore, that's the issue between you and God. Y'all got to deal with that. So God tells us to o obey him. When we deal with human beings, we deal with them by position, not personality, because the position is holy if the person is not. Oh, my God. Pastor, that's hard to do. No, it ain't. Y'all work for crazy supervisors and crazy owners. And you still do what they tell you. Come on now, help me now. Help me now, amen. You know, you've been in the military, brother Sweat. You don't salute the personality. The joker could be racist, but if he's the colonel, you the private, he the colonel, what you going to do? That's the way it works, people. So the issue down. You don't have an issue with your husband, you don't have an issue with your wife, you got an issue with God. Because God is the one who ordered you to do it. You ever ask the question, why did God let me make that choice? Why didn't God stop me? <laughs> why 
Why did he, oh, why did God, why did you just break this up? Why you didn't do it? Because God says sometimes demons are for your development. <laughs> I'm not going to let that demon destroy you, but I will let that demon develop you. When that demon get through with you, you'll know how to treat me from now on. Next time you're going to pray to me. Next time you ain't going to trust yourself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I believe in my heart that God allows us to be in situations in our life. It's because of our development. He's trying to develop us to, in order to bring us to the place that he designed for us. Are y'all hear what I'm saying to you today? That's why I don't criticize folk about what they go through because it's it up to you. God is sovereign. Don't let nobody fool that. God knows what's going to happen. God knows the kind of plan. He didn't say all things will be good. He said all things will work for good. When I get through working it, it's going to make you godly. Only a demon's going to have you wallowing in guilt about what you did and all the stuff. Everything that happened to you should have happened to you because it was part of your development. You wouldn't know me like you know me now. You wouldn't praise me like you praise me now. You don't serve me like you serve me now. If I had not let it happen to you, you wouldn't be. David said, you made me afflicted so I can walk in your ways. We don't hold our head down. We hold our hands up. Because the, the worse we look, the better he looks. Because look what God did with what God had to work with. Yes, I was in the club. Yes, I drank liquor. Yes, I did this. Yes, that was me. But look what a God can do. He don't need good to make good. He can take evil and make good. Because you are living witness on it. Somebody other than me. You are able to be able to testify that the Lord reached way down and pick you up and bring you up and got you to where you are today. You don't celebrate your wreck, baby. You celebrate your survival. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Only demonic people dismiss you based on your past. That's a worldly thing. For us as believers, our past is our badge of glory. Are y'all hear what I'm talking about? We ain't hiding it. We got a story to tell. We tell our children, your daddy ain't always been like this, baby. Your daddy, your daddy ain't always been like that. I told my son when he went to college, I said, "Hun, you want to be a good husband? He said, yes, sir, daddy. It's 15 women to one woman in Boston. I said, well, here it is. The way you be a good husband is date one woman at a time because God only wants you to have one. And he asked me the question, did you do that, Daddy? No, son. <laughs> no, no. That was before I met Jesus. Oh, my God. Amen. And then some of us, even after we met him, we still stumble. Y'all hear what I'm talking about? James called it the superfluity of naughtiness. It means... It means surplus sin that you still had even after you got saved. The Lord took some things away from you, but some stuff you still got. I wish I had about 10 real people in here to be able to testify. He took some things. I mean, he took some things, amen. Some of y'all had a potty mouth before you got saved, and you still got one. Push you the wrong way, wrong words still come out. Do I have a witness in here? Some of you was a horse man before you got saved. You don't do it no more, but you still got a horse spirit in you because you're still looking at what you ain't got no minutes looking at, lusting at what you ain't got no minutes lusting at. God has managed your sin even though he hadn't moved it yet. Why did he do that, Jeff? Because he could even take sin to make you do right. He managed it. He managed your sin. Solomon, man, Solomon downfall. I wish I could finish this lesson, but Solomon downfall. I'm going to do a part two of this because we need to get this. What was Solomon downfall? You got all this money. 
everything that is spiritual. He wasn't deficient of women. The Bible said he had 700 wives. He didn't know all them women's names. <laughs> 700 women. <laughs> and what is a concubine? A concubine was a second class wife. That was normally a wife you got from conquering another nation. When they would conquer other nations, they would pull out the finest women and put them in the king's harem. Those women were for his pleasure. He kept the Jewish women for propagation. That was the original intent of that. You bear children by your Jewish wives. Your concubines took care of you when your wife was on the cycle. Or for there's some other reason she may be sick. Now during pregnancy, they did not touch their wives during pregnancy. So that's a nine month drought that he had to go through. And you know, when you get used to eating every day, and somebody tell you you got to fast for nine months, that, that's just pushing the Holy Ghost too far. <laughs> the Bible even talks about that in First Corinthians 7. When he talks about you can go what is called a sexual fast. If you go on a sexual fast, the Bible says don't let it be long. Lest Satan would tempt you for your incontinence. So you cannot, you know, uh, say we're going to have a sexual fast. And you know, fasting and praying go well together. So if you're going to do a sexual fast, that means if you're used to having sex on Friday night, you know, that five minutes you have on Friday night, you spend that five minute praying. <laughs> but you know, but here's the thing: the most men up there weren't willing to do that, and this is why you get to the Book of Ephesians, and I can say I'll come back and finish this. I mean, do any y'all want me to finish this? One? The clock is ticking, but listen, listen, just like in the Book of Ephesians. And when Paul was writing to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesus, you can only have three wives. You can have your primary wife for your uh, children. Then you had your secondary wife. That was the woman that you used to fill in for your wife. <laughs> then the third wife was a temple prostitute. Because back then they worship a god that's by the name of Aphrodite. Aphrodite was a, a sexual priest who had a thousand priestesses. They worshiped the god by the name of Dionysius. Dionysius was considered the god of sex. And wine. Well, actually the god of wine, excuse me. He was the god of wine. And Dionysius was, so worship was drinking wine. That's why they call wine a spirit. <laughs> and what they would do when they were going to worship, they would drink wine. Now those of us who used to be drinkers, we know that wine is also an aphrodisiac. It makes you frisky. And so what they would do as part of worship they could pick out a temple priest. And they had the, um, the temple of, of Ergo. And the temple of Ergo, that's what they did. They drunk wine and they made love or had sex on the altar. That was part of worship. So that also included that you can have a temple priest, but you also, you can have a male prostitute if you were uh, a homosexual. Male prostitutes were called dogs. Temple priestesses would shave their heads. That's where you know that she was a prostitute. Males would let their hair grow long. 
that's how you knew that they were male prostitutes. And that's why Paul wrote, it is a shame for a man to wear long hair. Now, he didn't say it was a sin. He said it was a shame for what it represented in that culture. Because you remember in number six, the vow of the Nazarite, they were not allowed to cut their hair. Remember, Samson did not cut his hair. When he cut his hair, he lost his strength. So now, in this context, what the Bible has to be studied and not just written. Amen. All right. Give God praise to God. God bless you. Okay. Next week, we'll come back and we'll finish this uh, on next week. Part two of the clock is ticking. And uh, we get what happened to Samson. Uh, what happened to Samson? What brought him down, women? What happened to David, women? What happened to Solomon, women? That's why you have to be very careful when you choose a woman. She could be your greatest blessing. Or she can be your greatest curse. Now, it's not saying nothing that bad about women. Don't get it twisted. Because by creative design, I want to say this, by creative design, God created her as a help meet. Which telling Adam, you're not going to be able to finish what I want you to finish without her. That's why 1 Corinthians 11 and 11 says the man is not without the woman and the woman is not without the man. You would never be the man of God that you need to be because I haven't given everything to you. I took something out of you and I gave it to her to make sure that you would need her. But if it's the wrong woman, anything ain't your help is your hurt. Anything that don't help you will hinder you. Okay. All right. God bless you. We'll be here tonight at 7 p.m. Hope we can get a little bit further, but we just did what the Holy Spirit told us to do today. And so we just was obedient to him. Anybody were blessed today? Anybody were blessed today? And so we'll come back and do part two because I think Solomon is enough to be studied. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, the women turned his heart. They turned his heart. He got away from his God. And he messed up his whole family. Hmm. Wow. Okay. God bless you. Okay. We are excited uh, about the C-Care program. You know, that tremendous things are being done with that. We got the Alzheimer's program that's coming. And that's from April the 6th. You got to April the 2nd to be registered. That's to anybody in here. 10 warning signs of dementia. You need to get this, amen? Because you might discover you. Some things is a matter of aging. Some things is a matter of some other problem. So you need to be able to distinguish between the two. Amen? Okay. So I want you here. I want everybody here. Everybody here. If you have not registered, Barbara Hampton, she's right here. She can tell you how to get that done. You got to April the 2nd to get it done. If you're listening on Airways, hey, you can simply give a call to our church. They will show you how you can get it done. We want you to register for this. Okay, part two of the Veterans Workshop is this Saturday. Part two is starts at 10 o'clock. And it is open to everybody. We have medical people here. We're going to be sharing some more information. This is part of the holistic ministry of our church that we want to minister not only to your spirit, but to your soul and your body. We want you to get this information. Uh, we cannot give you a quantity of life, but we can help you get a quality of life. Nobody can make you live longer. Don't let nobody tell you that. Doctor say, hey, I'm going to make you live longer. Doc, doc, you don't control that because you could be healthy and dead. 
and a whole lot of death, they don't even know what happened to you. They don't know what happened to you. They just say apparent heart failure. Well, if your heart don't fail, you're still alive. Everybody die of heart failure. So you got to be able to do that. So once you be able to come to these things, these things are going to be helpful. We got some other things coming down the pipe. We want you to know we're not through. Uh, community resource, you're doing a tremendous job. I want you to know I'm very proud of the efforts we're making to reach resources, develop partnership with agencies that are providing resources to our people that we don't know nothing about. We need to educate our people. This is what we want to do. This is the direction that we're going in. Amen. Does that make any sense? Okay. So we, want, we thank God for opening those doors and for making those things available to us. And I want you to continue to pray for that as we continue to do that. Okay. Don't forget our intercessory prayer. We intercede on four devils in our church. We intercede for all medical people in, no matter where you are in the medical field, whether you're doctors, nurses, medicine, pharmacists, where you're, I call a pharmacist, or you're a legal drug dealer, whatever it is. You know, you know, we, we are praying for you, amen? Yes. We're praying for you. We're interceding for our educational people, Board of Education, for our school system, our teachers, our principals, uh, for all of our children and parents and uh, those who work with our kids. We are praying for you. We are praying for our first responders, beginning with our dispatchers who have to listen to all these 911 calls. And in addition to that, to our police and firemen who have to respond to it. In addition to that, we pray for our leaders, whether they're state, national, or local, we lift them up because God told us to pray for them. So we are praying for each and every one of them. That's who we are. We are praying for what happened in Baltimore. Uh, that is such a tragic thing and a very sad thing to happen there. But by the grace of God, more lives were spared that could have been spared. And the police was quick thinking, blocked the bridge off to keep other people off the bridges. And so it's just an unfortunate thing. It happens. And so we just praise God for who God is in spite of that. Okay, your late worshiper will give your offering to Brother Sweat. And, and uh, I want you to give to you, make him sweat. Give to you, make, give to you, make sweat sweat. Okay, amen. That's what we want to be able to do. Let's all stand. God bless you. God bless you. Father, we want to thank you for this day and want to thank you for all that you are and all that you do. We are praying for you continue to be with us. We lift up Reverend Hampton in the Hearts Grove Church who is in revival this week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I think. And we are praying for that success of those services uh, that is going to be happening there. For the food we're about to receive, for the fellowship you let us share as we go home to our homes and destinations, God, we give you the glory and the honor. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>